Hey, everybody. My name is Dr. Avidya Prakash. I'm an infectious diseases physician and chief medical officer and associate dean of clinical affairs and population health at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. Warm welcome to Health for the World Grand Rounds. It is an honor and a privilege to be a part of this with you. And it's especially an honor and a privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Vidya Sundaration, who is the Division Chief of Infectious Disease at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine and Professor of Clinical Internal Medicine. And so she's going to be expanding your knowledge um, and horizons about STIs. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Sundaration. And Pranithi and Health for the World team, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Prakash, and thank you very much, um, uh, Health for the World, um, for this invitation. And I'm really excited uh, to be talking to uh, some budding doctors and practicing doctors from around the world. So uh, a great opportunity and a great um, effort on the part of Health for the World. Uh, and thank you again for the invitation. So give me a moment to share my slides um, and let me know when you're able to see this. Are you able to see the slides? Yes, you can see it. And then uh, I will just put that, yeah, presentation mode. Right, exactly. Okay. All right, perfect. Great, great. So, um, you know, I've been tasked to talk about uh, CDC guidelines. I have a bunch of pictures. So if you look at the total number of slides, you might get overwhelmed. So don't don't look there. We're going to be um, going through a lot of pictures. And I want to also talk about uh, some changes uh, in the 2021 guidelines for CDC. So CDC puts out these guidelines for management of sexually transmitted infections. Um, and that's every five years. Um, the last one was in 2021. Uh, a one-year delay due to COVID, uh, but it is a, a group of experts that get together and look at all the data uh, for STIs in terms of epidemiology, what has the resistance patterns looked like, has it changed, um, which are, are groups are risk uh, have higher risk factors, uh, do we need to change anything about screening? Um, how do we modify treatments if, if it warrants any changes? So uh, these are some of the things that they address in the guidelines. The target audience for that is uh, anybody that takes care of uh, patients with sexually transmitted infections. Uh, it's about 180 pages or so. Um, you can download that. It's free of cost from the CDC's website. Um, it, it, people have it on their app phone uh, uh, as an app on their phone. Um, it's, uh, it can be printed out as a PDF and a very, very resourceful document. Uh, I tell my medical students, you don't need to know all the doses and know all the nitty gritties. You, you have this available on your app. Uh, always confirm. Uh, even if you know it, uh, just confirm the doses. It's, it's a great resource to have um, uh, and right at your fingertips. So we'll talk about um, a burden of diseases with some of the STIs that have been uh, described in the guidelines. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the epidemiology briefly. Um, and then diagnosis. Uh, what are some of the changes with diagnosis? And then also um, management, um, uh, the therapeutic management and some uh, in terms of what do you do with the partners, et cetera, uh, public health implications with screening and the updated guidelines from 2021. So 26 million new cases of STIs in the US annually. So it's a big problem. Um, so uh, what, what are some uh, consequences of that? Women's reproductive health, a lot of infertility because of that untreated chlamydia gonorrhea can lead to PID. And with recurrence, um, people have infertility. So it's one of the leading causes of infertility. And um, with women being affected, uh, what happens? Infants, uh, you worry about them uh, at birth as well. Um, we are already are uh, screening and we are aware there's quite a lot of awareness for torch infections, uh, infections which can be acquired anytime during pregnancy. 
uh, leading to infant mortality and morbidities. So that, that's a big issue. One of the uh, um, markers of how a country is doing in terms of um, uh, their, their health statistics, infant mortality is, is a big one there, right? So neonatal HIV, um, herpes, uh, congenital syphilis, all these transmission risks are very high if the mother has ongoing infection uh, at the time of birth. So uh, you need to worry about all that. In, uh, for the uh, sake of uh, women's reproductive health, women's health, and uh, for infants, and of course, men as well. Um, what does it uh, do in terms of healthcare costs? It's exorbitant. So um, we, we need to definitely pay attention to uh, uh, a screening and treatment in a uh, timely manner uh, so as to not uh, to, to limit the spread. Uh, so that's why there is a lot of emphasis on uh, diagnosis as well as treatment of these infections. Uh, so for STIs or STDs, um, STI is a better term, and I'll tell you why too. So um, of, of, for uh, these categories, you can um, look at them as ulcerative di diseases, syphilis, uh, typically causes a painless ulcer. Herpes will cause a clustered um, ulcer on, on an erythematous base, has a very typical appearance, painful. Uh, and then uh, lymphogranuloma venerum, um, which uh, can be painful once it um, uh, goes to the lymph nodes. Um, so it starts off as a painless ulcer, uh, and then it's basically a disease that's uh, caused by chlamydia, uh, one of the serovars of chlamydia, some of the serovars of chlamydia. Once it goes to the um, uh, lymph nodes or causes uh, anorectal disease, can be extremely painful. Chancroid hemophilus do cry. The, the name uh, do cry will suggest that this is a painful ulcer. And then uh, granuloma inguinal can be a painless ulcers, um, typical appearance of, you know, the, the edges being raised. Uh, they can uh, cause ulcers on concomitant surfaces, causing kissing ulcers. So there are specific uh, appearance of these ulcerative diseases um, for uh, certain STIs. And again, I wanted to talk about the burden uh, in terms of uh, uh, an infographic, which CDC puts out. And you can see, uh, sorry, I, I think my slides got exchanged. So um, this, um, uh, the, the burden here um, of 1.6 million cases of chlamydia uh, and 696,764 cases of gonorrhea, uh, you can compare that from the 2018 data and 2021 data. Uh, infographics are a nice way to uh, represent the, um, the problem. Um, you have um, uh, some graphics and then you also have words and it's just one um, a poster. So you can kind of print this out, put this in um, your clinic area where people will uh, look at it and say, oh my God, this is, this is really what's happening. Or, uh, you know, uh, for talks like this, uh, it kind of gives a perspective uh, of uh, what, the, what the problem is. Populations at risk, uh, youth, um, I, I'll say this again and again, a lot predominant uh, 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 infections, the age groups where you see predominant, almost 50% of the STIs or STDs is in uh, the age group of 15 to 24. Uh, and you'll hear me say this, um, the definition of old age keeps getting altered, right? For internal medicine, it used to be 70 plus, then 60 plus, and now 50 plus, you start seeing senescence of cells. For STIs, um, it was considered for all practical purposes because the bulk of the disease is in patients who are 15 to 24, 25 and above, uh, would be old age for STIs. Uh, but you do see STIs, um, in fact, um, patients who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s um, can have STIs as well. But the bulk, 50% uh, of the STI presentation will be in the age groups of 15 to 24. That's why, you know, um, for family medicine um, groups, they uh, see pediatric uh, patients, they see um, adults as well. So they 
pick up a lot of um, STIs in their clinics because of uh, the range of um, uh, age groups that they tend to uh, in their clinics. So uh, uh, family medicine partners are very important for us for diagnosis of uh, STIs. Uh, ERs, I'll talk about that as well, uh, where they see these, these age groups, um, uh, they, they pick up a lot of the STIs as well. There is a lot of uh, uh, differences, racial, ethnic minorities, socioeconomic status, uh, causing um, uh, differences in uh, the presentation. Uh, we've seen that um, African-Americans tend to have a higher uh, rate of chlamydia, gonorrhea, primary as well as secondary syphilis. And uh, that, that has been studied in comparison to Caucasians, uh, 5.8 times for uh, chlamydia, 12.4 times for gonorrhea, uh, syphilis 5.6 times. Uh, so there has been some racial and ethnic disparities as well. Marginalized populations have, um, you know, uh, different uh, rates. Access is, is one of the biggest thing. And then compliance. Compliance and access, uh, these two really um, are also uh, issues that we need to look into um, while taking um, uh, a history, uh, social determinants of health are very important uh, for STI management. Uh, and then risk factors, pregnant women, uh, presence of HIV, and then sexual practices, uh, men having sex with men, higher rates of uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, higher rates of co-infection, um, HIV and syphilis co-infection. We're seeing rates of syphilis rise up. The li line is almost like this uh, for the last couple of years. Um, HIV also actually, uh, the numbers have gone up despite um, good control, a lot of changes with um, uh, undetectable uh, equals untransmissible. Uh, the medications, which are so easy to take despite that, co-infection rates um, and syphilis has kind of gone up a little bit, uh, uh, quite a bit uh, in the last few years. Uh, so 35 different infections kind of comprise uh, STIs. There's no uh, set definition, uh, but it, about 35 uh, infections uh, are in this uh, complex um, of STI um, infections, and they can affect uh, skin, mucosal surfaces, oropharynx. Don't forget the oropharynx. Uh, a lot of the uh, infections now, uh, we have FDA-approved um, swabs, which can uh, detect infections in the oropharynx as well. And then, of course, the genital areas and rectum, rectal swabs as well. So um, those areas should not be forgotten. Rectal area and the, the oropharynx for uh, swabbing, and we have now FDA approved tests for those as well. Uh, so you will see uh, what is the uh, a better term, STI, STD, even in my slides, I, I realize I interchange this quite a bit, but um, these um, uh, STI is a, is a better term to use uh, and it validates that not all infection is actually in symptom, is symptomatic. So you can have a lot of people who are asymptomatic, right? So uh, it validates that and recognizes the asymptomatic nature of these infections when you say STI versus STD. Uh, and then also it's considered to be a more inclusive term and consistent with really our goal uh, to prevent and treat infections before developing the disease. So, so uh, that becomes a, a better, better term um, uh, to use. Um, so uh, between those two, uh, SDI should be the preferred term. All right. Um, and then uh, I told you about the ulcerative diseases. The, the next group here would be um, uh, diseases with uh, discharge or drainage. So gonorrhea, chlamydia, non-gonococcal urethritis, mucopurulent cervicitis, uh, a trick or trichomonas vaginitis, uh, candidiasis, not quite an STD, but um, can cause uh, vaginal discharge or drainage, and then uh, bacterial vaginosis. Uh, and then, of course, uh, um, some major concerns with uh, HPV, uh, you can have uh, um, uh, drainage, and then but the bigger, biggest concern there is the development of cancer. Urethritis, a gonococcal, non-gonococcal uh, urethritis, you can divide this based on the organisms as well. Uh, so presentations as well as organisms, uh, the, uh, the classification can be based on those. Uh, so cervicitis, um, 
as, uh, which part of the uh, uh, the GU tract or GI, uh, GU tract is involved. So cervicitis, urethritis, GI, GU tract, and then pelvic inflammatory diseases uh, based on the organisms which kind of cause this. Um, epithelial cell infections. So that's where um, uh, genital warts, human papilloma, uh, a, a, a molluscum. Um, uh, contagiosum can be, uh, as well as HPV, uh, these fall under this category. And then uh, ectoparasites, uh, pubic lice, KBs are also classified uh, in this. When we see genital lesions, it's important uh, also to keep in mind that there can be non-venereal causes of these. I've listed some of those, Bouchette's disease, uh, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, contact dermatitis, lichen planus, um, HS, hydradenitis, et cetera, can be mimickers, so something to keep in mind. I've included this, don't, don't get scared. Uh, I can't read this either. <laughs> this is on CDC's website. So this uh, is a summary of the uh, STI treatment guidelines from 2021, very useful document. If you print it and put it in your uh, clinics, um, just a quick reference, uh, turn back, look at that. And it's a very quick reference, has uh, a treatment guidelines for all those that I listed in the previous slides. A uh, very useful document will give you um, the recommended regimen and an alternate regimen for these as well. So in this talk, we'll talk about chlamydia, gonorrhea, BV, um, genital herpes, um, human papilloma virus, PID, syphilis, trick, and we're going to go through these uh, fairly quickly. Start with a question. 28-year-old male had a sexual encounter with a sex worker while on business um, in Seattle one week ago. After returning home, he notes burning sensation uh, with urination and yellow discharge in his underclothes. Microscopic examination shows four plus leukocytes and a gram stain is shown below. Um, if you cannot see it clearly, uh, there's a lot of pink dots within the, the multiple, multiple lobes of the neutrophils. So intracellular gram negative organisms gram-negative intracellular diplococci, G-N-I-D-S. All right, so what is the best course of action for this patient? And you give him a prescription for doxycycline uh, for seven days, or you would give two prescriptions for ofloxacin for the patient, and then one for his partner or his wife. Uh, administer 500 milligrams of IM, uh, ceftriaxone, draw blood for VDRL, HIV, um, and arrange for his uh, wife to be examined, or you can um, give her treatment with, with the patient. Uh, administer a single dose of ceftriaxone, 125 milligrams, um, and uh, ciprofloxacin also. In addition, draw blood for VDRL, HIV, uh, arrange for his wife to be examined and treated. Or the last option here is administer a single dose of cefixin, 400 milligrams, and then do the rest uh, as the other options, drawing blood and getting his wife examined. Uh, I can see some of you. Uh, uh, tell me how many of you will opt for A. Raise, show me your hands. Raise, raise your hands. I can see some of you. No takers. How about B? Okay, no takers. How about C? Okay, I see a few hands, quite a few hands. How about D? How about E? All right, I think you guys nailed you guys nailed it. It is C Ceftriaxone um, IM, uh, and you will see uh, one thing that's different from uh, previous guidelines. How many of you think that this is an incomplete treatment? Would you add anything? I see some heads nodding. Would you add anything? Raise your hands if you would add anything. Okay, a few hands there. Um, so that's a change. We don't need to add anything. So that would be uh, something we'll talk about. <clears throat> All right, next is question two. Sexually active uh, uh, female patient complains of arthralgia, a wrist and ankle pain, um, as, uh, as well as swelling, skin rash, and fever. Um, she has 12 skin nodules on the extremities. She has 
genus synovitis of the extensors of the right wrist. Um, she has left ankle swelling and warmth. What do you think is the pathogen? Uh, is it chlamydia? Is it treponema pallidum? Is it Neisseria gonorrhea? Neisseria meningitis? Is it HIV or is it strep pneumo? How many of you will go with one? Two? Three? Four? Five? And six? Okay, you got it. So it's nice area gonorrhea there. So with gonorrhea, um, our numbers kind of went up and down. Uh, when you had effective treatment, it worked. Um, 1979, around that time, the numbers really started to come down. Cetraxone, uh, third generation cephalosporins, quinolones. Actually, uh, the, the time we had quinolones available, everybody was getting quinolones. They don't work anymore, unfortunately. Um, so now the rates are going up, um, uh, mainly because, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, of course, um, the resistance patterns, um, we need to study very, very carefully, use the right medications. So antimicrobial stewardship uh, is very, very important there. Um, this uh, breakdown is available for most of the STIs. I'm not going to belabor the slide, but, you know, areas which are really dark um, have high rates. I'm in Illinois. Our rates are uh, a little bit lesser than the darkest, but we still have pretty high rates here as well. Uh, they talk about age group, um, uh, you know, uh, and we, like we said, 15 to 24, uh, you see um, those bars uh, for whether it's males or females. You see actually a lot of STIs in males. Um, and, and even in this, as compared to females, you're seeing higher numbers. Um, and then the age groups would be uh, 15 to 24 again, which are highest. And they also do this for other STIs. They talk about um, where do you see, where are the diagnoses mainly made? Uh, private physicians do that, but uh, ERs are actually a very important part of diagnosing. Uh, a lot of people just go with symptoms. Young people you know, uh, may not may, uh, have health insurance, uh, go to ERs with these uh, symptoms. We have STI clinics, the uh, STD clinics with uh, the health department um, is uh, in fact offers, if they have a public, a, a public aid card, a lot of the treatment is completely free or very, very, very subsidized. Nice part about these clinics, patient presents, they get examined. Um, sometimes these treatments are like, you're just one and done, right? I am septriaxone, one and done. Uh, azithromycin used to be great because one gram given by mouth, one and done, you're done. And then uh, you can give the patients medications uh, for their partners because you don't want them to have recurrence. So that's also important. They thought about that and they gave a uh, treatment to the patient uh, uh, and you were protected by law in Illinois. We were protected when we did that. It's called expedited partner therapy. So you gave the pills, taking care of the partners uh, for spread as well. Okay. Um, so um, uh, it, it, STI clinics are pretty neat um, and not every place has it, but with, if they have it, it's a great setup for treatment of these patients. Um, then again, um, in terms of groups, uh, MSM uh, women uh, and then men having sex with women, uh, heterosexual um, uh, contact. So most of the STIs, um, CDC does a very nice job of surveillance um, and they're, they're doing this very, very closely. Our pathogenesis for this, um, uh, now you all know that uh, there are certain proteins, uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, exclusively human um, reservoir, we, uh, human uh, pathogen. We don't have any reservoirs, no animal reservoirs, for that matter, even uh, nature. Um, it doesn't really survive very well. So um, there are these proteins uh, with, in the four stages uh, attaches to the trophic cell, which is the mucosal cell, local penetration or invasion occurs, then there's local proliferation and dis dissemination. Uh, so those are the four stages that you see with uh, the pathogenesis of Neisseria. Um, the presentation, clinical manifestations can be um, urethritis, proctitis, endocervical canal primary infections. Um, you can also have colonization uh, of the urethra. Uh, and then the uh, incubation to symptom onset is about 10 days. Uh, that 
uh, you can get with the history. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, a lot of them are can also be asymptomatic. But uh, in the STI clinics, when you see them, um, um, they will typically present with the drips. You'll see the purulent drainage, uh, and that can give you a clue that uh, this is gonorrhea. Remember for this, we do the uh, pharyngeal swab, rectal swab, now that's FDA approved, um, and that's also part of the workup that we should do. I'm gonna uh, run through a lot of these. Um, acute urethritis, uh, predominant manifestation in men. Uh, and say a typical um, uh, incubation period is about two to five days, can range from one to 10 days. And then uh, urethral discharge, dysuria, uh, you can have symptoms uh, in men. In fact, the um, differentiating factor between chlamydia and gonorrhea in men, uh, the drainage looks different, so they, that uh, uh, gets their attention. Chlamydia, you may, a lot of them are like completely asymptomatic. So you don't pick that up a lot. With this, the drainage gets people's attention um, and they, they come to the um, STI clinics. We ask for um, a dysuria, we, uh, we ask for any pain. Um, so, you know, uh, the typical symptoms can, they can check the box plus minus, but drainage is, is something that we see. These are some of the pictures that you'll find in, um, in the uh, uh, CDC's website. Gonococcal ophthalmia in children uh, who are born um, to mothers who may be positive, um, that is something to look for. Uh, children still get the gentamicin ointment um, at birth. Um, so, so that's, that's uh, something uh, done for prevention. Disseminated gonococcal infection, uh, you can't see pictures of this in your exam. Um, you, you see these nodular lesions um, on top of joints. Think about disseminated infection. Bartholin cyst, uh, again, <clears throat> uh, think of uh, um, working up for gonorrhea for, uh, when you see these. Uh, disseminated gonococcal infection, special word uh, that was uh, in the question that we kind of talked about, asympt asymptomatic joint uh, involved, asymmetric joint and um, uh, joint and uh, involvement, not asymptomatic, monoarticular uh, septic arthritis. Think about this in a young patient, monoarticular septic arthritis, uh, definitely uh, work them up for gonorrhea. And, and then the uh, ceftrax on treatment here is uh, one gram, so higher. Um, and um, for disseminated infection, you want to uh, give them a treatment for about a week or so. This is not one and done. This is def a, a longer duration of treatment for uh, disseminated infection. Uh, gram stain uh, will have this typical appearance of uh, intracellular gram negative diplococci. Um, lab testing, um, now urine is actually... Um, a good source. Uh, you don't really need swabs. So in the STI clinics, everybody gets a cup. Um, so NAT testing, uh, nucleic acid amplification testing, PCR also available. Um, and uh, these are the results are uh, available fairly quickly. And that is what has actually changed. Earlier, uh, we would uh, co-treat anybody that has gonorrhea with chlamydia as well. Reason being, chlamydia is very common. Um, more common than uh, gonococcal infections. So co-infections co with those are common. So that's why um, in the previous guidelines, we would say, go ahead and um, give azithromycin or doxycycline for treatment of uh, uh, chlamydia along with the treatment of gonorrhea. Now, uh, this has been a game changer with the available, uh, availability of the nucleic acid amplification tests. Uh, you can get the test results soon, so you don't need to use azithromycin. And that's also important for infectious diseases stewardship standpoint, because you don't want to be giving azithromycin uh, uh, rampantly, um, we're already seeing a lot of resistance there uh, in the chlamydia groups. So azithromycin has in fact gone to alternate regimen. It's not even the first line anymore. So um, that's the reason we want to minimize the use of um, uh, co-treatment, especially when you have this information available. If you don't have the information, uh, you're treating a partner, it makes uh, sense to uh, give doxycycline for seven days. Uh, but you know, definitely use your judgment if you're not able to have uh, that information. 
uh, it, it's it's okay to give uh, um, doxycycline. Doxycycline now is the the uh, the first line for chlamydia. Azithromycin has gone to second line. So uh, you'll see that, but it's really not not necessary. Um, and I'm sorry, the the uh, ceftrax and dose uh, has also gone up now to 500, not uh, not. Uh, 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 250, not 125, it, the dose has increased to 500. All right. Uh, so there is a national data, uh, which is uh, looking at uh, the surveillance data, which is looking at resistance. Uh, and they look at resistance for azithromycin, cefexime, oral cephalosporin, and ceftriaxone. Uh, we don't unfortunately have a, the oral alternate alternative that's used um, a lot. It's still on the guidelines when you cannot use uh, IM ceftriaxone, go ahead and use cefexine. Um, but uh, you'll see that the resistance has actually uh, gone up quite a bit. So azithromycin is not, not recommended. Somebody is allergic to ceph uh, cephalosporin. In that situation, you use gentamicin plus azithromycin. You give two, two antibiotics at that, at that time. Um, this is an older slide. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, um, the uh, dose is here. Uh, I took the picture because this is kind of very nice. Um, the dose here is 500 milligrams for ceftriaxone, and it will kind of show you that's uh, that's kind of what is being used now, and how the uh, the surveillance data shows over time uh, the development of resistance to quinolones, um, to azithromycin, macrolides. And, uh, and then oral cephalosporins. So like I said, azithromycin no, no longer needed. And I think I corrected the dose here uh, to 500 milligrams IM times one. All right. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, oral cefixime, when you're using that, um, uh, the dose for that also has now, in fact, with the newer guidelines, they recommend a much higher dose of oral cefixime. Um, and um, EPT, um, the expedited partner therapy, uh, if you're not sure, it's okay to go ahead and use azithromycin or doxycycline. Chlamydia, again, um, adolescent and young adults, you'll see the same thing um, uh, from um, uh, the epidemiology, very similar to gonorrhea as well. Um, here, the life cycle uh, has basically uh, two forms, uh, the uh, um, uh, elementary bodies there and then the reticular bodies. The elementary bodies are um, uh, operative for the attachment to mucosal uh, surfaces. And then uh, in the intracellular uh, uh, phase, they uh, actually uh, form reticular bodies. The reticular bodies um, multiply, uh, form more elementary bodies, break the cell open, and infect new cells. So uh, that's the life cycle there for chlamydia. Um, the biggest thing here is a lot of the people are asymptomatic. You want to um, recognize this uh, screening, pregnant women, uh, screening women uh, in the high risk age groups when they have multiple sexual partners, uh, any high risk, this should be done. People with HIV who are sexually active, uh, we screen them um, every, um, uh, every year at least. And then more frequently if, uh, if the risk factors are MSM and, and uh, you know, multiple sexual partners, uh, then definitely uh, the screening should be done more frequently. Uh, that's a, a big important way of identifying and treat, treatment uh, being administered early. Um, some of the problems associated with this infertility in women, pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, ectopic pregnancies, um, so uh, clinical syndromes, again, similar to what you see in gonorrhea, cervicitis, dysuria, pyuria syndrome, uh, PID. Uh, specifically here, you can see the perihepatitis. I have a picture of that later on too. Proctitis, urethritis, conjunctivitis, uh, epididymitis. Um, here you'll see that it's not very purulent, right? Angry looking cervix, very angry looking uh, cervix with mucopurulent discharge, uh, but uh, different from gonorrhea, which has pus. Uh, the perihepatitis here, you'll see um, inflammation extending all the way to the liver capsule. Uh, a lot of the times, uh, a laparoscopic diagnosis is necessary. Women coming in with abdominal pain. You can see this uh, not, not very common um, finding, but can be associated with chlamydia infections. 
And uh, non-gonococcal urethritis in males, um, so chlamydia uh, trachomatis most, of, most commonly causes that. Uh, mycoplasma genitalium, uh, another one causing non-gonococcal urethritis, uh, uh, it's a different organism, but uh, causes recurrent infections, persistence, uh, and that this time in the 2021 uh, section, uh, uh, the STI uh, guidelines has got its own section, uh, mycoplasma genitalium. Uh, and that has a lot of resistance to azithromycin. Um, doxycycline is the drug of choice there. Um, they also say that if there is persistence or recurrence, um, you can use sequential therapy with doxycycline and ofloxacin. Um, uh, they recommend checking for resistance testing with uh, when there are infections with mycoplasma. So anything that's not gonorrhea kind of clubs, get clubs, uh, get uh, cl uh, gets clubbed with this diagnosis of non-gonococcal urethritis, chlamydia being part of that, um, genital mycoplasmas, uteoplasma, mycoplasma, um, and uh, trick also gets clubbed in that part uh, of non-gonococcal urethritis. All right, and then uh, for screening and diagnosis, uh, we again have urine tests with nucleic acid amplification, antigen detection, genetic probe methods, uh, and chlamydia rapid testing is available. Sensitivity can vary. There are lots of tests. Sensitivities can vary, but uh, specificity, uh, I'm talking about those rapid tests, um, the specificity is, is uh, very high. Um, and again, um, screening is very important here. Uh, we already talked about that. Se or sexually active women, 25 years or younger, um, sexually active women uh, with risk factors when over uh, 25 years, all asymptomatic pregnant women, um, and then uh, insufficient evidence uh, to recommend um, uh, for, uh, for routine screening. So you don't really need uh, routine uh, 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 screening for, for men. For women, definitely, uh, they're, they're recommending that if pregnant um, and then with risk factors. All right, um, I'm going to move on. So doxycycline is the drug of choice there. Azithromycin has moved to the alternate group there. Uh, PID, um, uh, again, associated with chlamydia and gonorrhea. Infertility is the biggest problem. Change here with PID now, with the 2021 guidelines, is the treatment. Treatment regimen. Uh, metronidazole has been added to uh, the treatment regimen. So you have doxycycline, you do ceftriaxone, and then metronidazole for anaerobic coverage has, has actually been added uh, in the new guidelines for um, PID as the, uh, the, the primary regimen there. Um, so for PID, you can have a combination of endometritis, salpingitis, tubovarian abscesses, uh, pelvic peritonitis. You need to determine if the patient uh, needs admission to the hospital or not. Uh, and then based on that, um, uh, definitely the, the treatments can be decided whether IM, IV, uh, and then like I said, metronidazole has been added there. Uh, next group of infections with vaginitis. Um, uh, this is a table borrowed from UpToDate uh, and very nice one. I don't know if you have access to UpToDate, but uh, there's a very nice table there which talks about uh, the differential diagnosis. I show this to our medical students. Uh, pH can help us identify exactly what infection this is. Uh, and then, um, you know, there are other characteristics there too. Uh, vaginitis, vulvovaginitis, the uh, vaginal discharge would be thick, uh, curdy white that can help us identify. Uh, for uh, bacterial vaginosis, the malodorous drainage. Uh, for trichomonas, uh, um, apart from being malodorous, um, it can also be frothy. So uh, some specific characteristics in the appearance um, can help us but you definitely need to do uh, tests. You can actually start with a TCG a probe test, which uh, can be done, uh, give a, can give a quick uh, identification. Best is having a microscope. We have one in the STI clinic. Um, uh, look under the microscope, trichomonas, um, easy to identify. These flagella will be, the flagellated organisms will be swimming all over the, uh, the field. So easy to identify that. And then you see that frothy discharge with uh, trichomonas. Uh, 
uh, wet mount can be performed uh, in in office, and then you have gen probes, uh, which are also uh, available uh, for rapid testing. Um, and then uh, metronidazole uh, can be given as a single dose, um, can be given as seven uh, seven day treatment for uh, trichomonas. The 2021 guidelines, in fact, um, spoke a lot about trichomonas um, uh, identification with NAT testing uh, for trichomonas. Earlier, we had just those um, microscopic appearance um, and then uh, you know saline, um, where we would inoculate the saline. Uh, and incubate those next day when you uh, come and check under the microscope, you find um, the entire field teeming with uh, trichomonas. But now with NAT testing, again, that is uh, much faster and more reliable. Um, so uh, that's uh, another addition now with the 2021 guidelines where they've talked about uh, trichomonas uh, identification as well as uh, early treatment for this. All right. Uh, and a follow up, um, you want to tell uh, your patients to abstain, uh, trichomonas particularly, uh, to abstain, uh, and then treatment of partner is necessary for trichomonas. You don't ne you don't need to do that for vag uh, vaginitis with uh, bacterial vaginosis or uh, or uh, uh, candida, but for trichomonas, uh, partner treatment um, is definitely important there. Uh, bacterial vaginosis, um, Gardnerella, uh, uh, you know, most of these polymicro are polymicrobial infections. Uh, so essentially, there is a lack of good bacteria, lactobacillus. That's uh, that's mm, there's lack of that. So uh, the other bacteria overgrow, uh, causing this infection. Uh, most common cause of vaginitis, vaginosis, vaginitis. Some some people prefer to call it vaginosis, um, but uh, that's that's a term. Uh, either of those is acceptable, uh, and then prevalence can also vary by race and ethnicity, um, more in um, uh, certain minority races, and some practices like douching, etc., uh, can uh, lead to bacterial vaginosis as well. Um, identified now with the a pre, premature rupture of membranes, uh, premature delivery, um, and uh, especially acquisition of HIV as well has been identified. Apart from the gynecological issues in pregnant women, acquisition of HIV is another, another uh, thing that they have identified uh, with uh, a lot of the STIs, not just a bacterial vaginosis, herpes, a lot of the others that they have in fact now mentioned in the 2021 guidelines. And all those are based on data that um, is collected with uh, excellent surveillance mechanisms. All right. Um, so this is what uh, your slides will look like um, when you uh, prepare a wet mount. You see normal epithelial cells just laden with bacteria there. Um, and again, normal flora will look like this. Bacterial vaginosis will look like this. What is the indication to treat? You can find a lot of people colonized with bacteria too. What is the indication to treat? Symptoms, symptoms, symptoms. When anybody has symptoms, you treat them. Metronidazole can be used as a, as a cream. Flindamycin can be used as a, clean, a cream or a metronidazole can be taken as a tablet as well. Herpes, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the new things with herpes. Um, here, a cluster of ulcers uh, in an erythematous base. Hard to identify because, you know, you don't see this typical picture in a lot of people that have recurrent herpes infections. It won't be painful anymore. They don't uh, come with the typical uh, symptoms that uh, we always describe in, with primary herpes. So with recurrent herpes, it can be difficult to diagnose. Um, with the 2021 guidelines, they talked about uh, the type specific cultures and type specific serologies. And these become important because um, um, HSV2 tends to uh, cause more recurrence. So how you counsel patients will be different with HSV1 versus HSV2. 
Uh, and treatments now, they've consolidated that a little bit more. Um, the um, ace, treatment with acyclovir, femcyclovir, valacyclovir, uh, they have streamlined those in terms of what you do with recurrence um, and for primary infections, how long to treat, uh, usually five to seven days. Uh, and then they have uh, a consolid uh, give, streamlined those doses as well with the 2021 um, guidelines. Um, so uh, those are the changes. They do recommend getting the, uh, the type-specific serologic tests uh, when there are no lesions. And then they also uh, recommend the, uh, the um, uh, culture or uh, getting the uh, PCR testing or NAT testing uh, to identify which type HSV-1 or HSV-2. That's, that's the new recommendation with 2021 guidelines. Herpes cervicitis can be uh, pretty bad and painful, so we should know how to identify that. Again, recurrent health, uh, also, um, HSV looks so different from primary, right? Uh, you don't really find those, uh, those lesions that uh, we typically associate with uh, clustering, erythematous base, painful, may not always be painful there. Starts with vesicles, painful ulcerations, crusting, usual when, with the primary uh, infection. And again, PCR, culture, serologies, and then uh, the, the treatment updates that I told you about. HPV, um, the biggest thing here, uh, the new information is uh, the vaccine. Um, <clears throat> men um, from the age group of 27 to 45 can have shared decision-making prior to that vaccine, uh, HPV vaccine is available uh, for um, uh, children who are males as well as females. So, so that, is, that is something that they have kind of harmonized with the other um, advisory um, uh, committee uh, uh, guidelines for immunization practices. So uh, that, has been, that has been changed with the 2021 guidelines and reiterated, I should say. Uh, men having sex with men, higher prevalence. Uh, so they do talk about the, uh, the risk factors there. Um, and then also uh, with certain practices like circumcision where the, uh, the prevalence can, can come down. Um, so again, these graphs will tell you which age groups you're still seeing the same thing. So that's a theme, right? 15 to 24, you see, see a lot of, lot of these. Um, but, you know, HPV, uh, you worry about because of the, the propensity to cause cervical cancer, uh, anal cancer. So screening is very, very important and um, identifying these. It's not hard to identify. Very typical uh, appearance with that um, cauliflower looking condyloma acuminata versus uh, condyloma lata, which you see with syphilis. Uh, don't confuse those terms. Uh, this is that very uh, typical warty cauliflower-like uh, growth uh, that you see with uh, with um, HPV. Perianal warts can be uh, pretty problematic. A surgery is required. Uh, for treatments, um, imicomod um, can be used if it's a small lesion, just the cream, TCA, trichloroacetic acid is also used in our STI clinics. But if it's really big um, perianal lesions, we need um, help of surgeons to, uh, uh, to take care of those. All right. Um, syphilis. Um, that's a big problem. Big, 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 big problem now. Um, numbers are going up a lot. Uh, across the board, men having sex with men higher, but across the board, it's, it's really going up. Uh, in fact, the latest curves are almost like almost vertical. So it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, uh, in fact, in uh, our clinics, um, every time I'm in clinic, I'm seeing a new patient with syphilis. So uh, in infectious diseases, so it's it's a lot. Definitely um, something that we um, need to um, take very seriously um, uh, to to ensure that we are you know addressing the problem uh, adequately. Primary syphilis, painless ulcer. Um, a lot of the times, people don't even realize that there is an ulcer. Uh, secondary syphilis, this is dissemination of the spirochete that occurs. You see a rash, characteristic rash, condyloma lata, those purple pink lesions that can appear as well. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, treatment with benzathine penicillin. Uh, the combination of benzathine and trocaine uh, in the 2021 guidelines, they tell you not recommended. So benzathine, long-acting penicillin um, is important. 
Um, they also stress that, uh, you know, penicillin uh, allergy testing is now available. Use that. The skin testing, if you, you uh, don't just dismiss a patient as having a penicillin allergy and giving them doxycycline. So um, uh, that doesn't work as well. Seen a lot of patients take doxycycline and, and come back. So, uh, um, you know, or have failures there. Uh, they don't see that fourfold decrease in their titles. So um, definitely uh, keep that in mind. And, um, you know, if you have allergy testing, you should test for allergy testing with penicillin for, for syphilis. These pictures, again, are available on CDC's website. Appearance of chancres, secondary syphilis, uh, the rash, the characteristic involvement of palms and soles there. Um, and uh, flat lesions there. This is a condyloma lata, the pinkish purplish lesions that you see with secondary syphilis. Uh, alopecia, not all alopecia is syphilis, but uh, syphilis can cause alopecia as well. Uh, and then uh, syphilitic gummas, late stage syphilis that you do see um, these uh, gummatous lesions, ulcerating lesions that, that can appear. Um, syphilis is a great mimicker, um, uh, can affect any organ, right? Um, so, uh, you know, syphilis, you know, medicine. Um, so cardiovascular syphilis uh, causing the narrowing of there of uh, the aorta there, aortitis, syphilitic aortitis, neurosyphilis. Um, this is an autopsy specimen with spirochetes that were seen in the neural, neural tissue. So the line drawn there is late latent syphilis. Otherwise, it's one injection of penicillin. Otherwise, three injections of penicillin, late latent. Uh, and then if it's neurosyphilis, uh, you want to use IV crystalline penicillin there. Um, I want to mention one change from 2021 guidelines here, uh, which is in pregnant women, uh, syphilis is a big problem. So uh, if you identify uh, an RPR, which is elevated, you treat it early in syphilis, uh, early in pregnancy, they also recommend giving another dose if the titers, because you don't have time, right? And um, now they also say for late latent, you can give up to two years time for those titers to come down. You know, the patient has been treated. Don't keep checking titers again and again, because if it's not coming down, we get worried and then we treat them again. That's a big mistake people make. So you want the titers to come down, give a good two years for late latent is what they're saying. And then for pregnant women, um, you know, uh, if you treat them early on in their pregnancy, uh, you should also consider a second dose uh, for, for pregnant women. So that's something that they have kind of added with the um, 2021 guideline. So uh, I don't know if I have uh, much time, but I just want to quickly uh, tell you about LGV. Um, uh, telling you the ulcer can be painless, but this is a, a lymphatic system uh, infection with uh, different serovars of uh, chlamydia, not trachomatis, also caused by chlamydia, but lymph nodes can be involved. Perianal, uh, once the, um, the infection is spread to the lymph nodes in the perianal areas, can be very, very painful. HIV patients, this is usually uh, endemic subtropical areas, uh, Western Europe. Uh, you're seeing that, you see this in North America as well. Uh, but um, mainly subtropical areas uh, is where uh, uh, you see a preponderance in this. But with men having sex with men in that particular group, proctitis is something that we associate with this. Uh, chronic um, LGV, this can cause chronic disease with elephantiasis, genital elephantiasis there. You'll see uh, these ulcers can, um, uh, these uh, lymph nodes can ulcerate, become really big, can ulcerate uh, and cause abscesses. Uh, chancroid uh, with the hemophilus ducre, painful ulcers can affect the lymph nodes in the same way, um, can cause uh, uh, um, you know, uh, abscesses as well. Uh, this would be the appearance of the gram stain, um, a hemophilus gram negative organism. So you will you will see that there. Granuloma inguinal too, again, endemic um, in, in areas um, of, um, um, you see that a lot in uh, India, uh, some of the other uh, areas of the world. Uh, and then granuloma inguinal kissing ulcers, common there uh, that you will see. Uh, we don't see much of granuloma inguinal here uh, in, in our uh, patient population here. 
Um, the Donovan bodies, some of the inclusion, Donovan veniosis, you can see the organisms uh, uh, intracellularly, uh, which you can identify. And then, you know, I want to end with uh, the ectoparasites, a lab, uh, uh, um, crab, lice, and then scabies. Uh, permethrin would be the treatment for these. Um, uh, a molluscum is also seen. Uh, HIV and hepatitis B also uh, included in this in this uh, uh, group of STIs, but that that cannot be covered today. So I will stop here. I will uh, give about five minutes or so for any questions or discussions that you may have. All right, thank you very much. That was a very, very good presentation. I think we covered a lot of um, high yield uh, bugs and drugs that go with them. So um, thank you. Uh, yeah, any questions? in the chat or uh, Dr. Chinda's team, if you'd like to unmute, leave the five last couple of minutes for you guys. Um, let me ask uh, our students, what kind of STDs or STIs do you guys see? And where do you diagnose most of your STIs? Any one of you unmute or use the chat and yeah, we just unmuted. Well, let me start by thanking you for a great presentation, really. You had a lot of things to group together and put it in an R, and you still managed to keep us enthusiastic and eager to learn more. So thank you very much. Now, we do see a lot of STIs around here, and uh, the main ones, are the ones you, you talked about, we see all of those around here. And the group, the population that is affected should be similar to what you mentioned there, 15 to 24 years old. Though we do see that also in elder, in, el in older patients as well. And the way we test uh, is usually going to be through uh, occasionally urethral swabs, we still get to do that. I don't know if any of us in the group here has ever tested for Neisseria on urine. I don't think so. We all we almost always use urethral swab. And that was going to be one of my questions for you. Maybe I can give that before I continue with the comments. Like, does it decrease sensitivity at all to use urine as a testing specimen instead of a urethral swab for Neisseria? No, actually that's what the FDA says and CDC has uh, approved that in their guidelines. So urine is just as sensitive uh, to, to pick up uh, and, you know, a NAD testing, uh, nucleic acid amplification picks up very fast. It's a, it's a very sensitive test. So um, you're able to do it just as well um, in, in urine or, uh, um, you know, pharyngeal swabs, rectal swabs actually are also now, now FDA approved for this. You know, Dr. Vidya, that was one of my concerns, actually. Now, nucleic acid amplification testing is you you can have it like but it's not readily available elsewhere exactly you have to send it to a specialized lab here in Cameroon to get there so we still have to rely most of the time on gram stain yeah to, to make to establish our diagnosis for us and occasionally we have to deal with serology for for, for bugs like chlamydia so in that context, would you still ascribe the same sensitivity to urine testing instead of uh, urethral swaps, for example, if you are still thinking about Neisseria? Great question. So, you know, gram stains are always very hard. Chlamydia, you cannot culture. Some bacteria are so hard to culture. Um, same thing with uh, Neisseria too. You know, if you're doing throat cultures, you pick up any nice area, you wouldn't know what it is. So that's the advantage of doing type specific um, nucleic acid amplification. We definitely have an advantage with that test. But uh, when you're looking under the gram stain, I would say uh, it has to be the full picture. History is so important when you're taking um, uh, or uh, managing patients with STIs, getting a good history um, and uh, uh, getting all the components of that then uh, identifying any of the uh, physical findings that you have. And then if you are able to look under the microscope, that's what you have. 
gram negative intracellular diplococci, lot of white cells, lot of white cells with uh, chlamydia. In fact, um, one of our students had presented this. Um, we were grading the white cells when we just had microscopes. Uh, we were not using that testing as much. So I think in your setting, it makes sense not to drop the doxycycline along with uh, um, a, 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 the intramuscular septrax. And if you're treating, you probably want to combine that with the doxy too, uh, if you don't know um, if they have co-infection with chlamydia. Uh, but you know, uh, typically when we just had the microscope, we would look at the white cells, grade them, one plus, two plus, three plus uh, in men, uh, when you don't find the gram-negative intracellular diplococci in just a lot of white cells, chlamydia. If you find the gram-negative intracellular diplococci along with the white cells, they're intracellular, then gonorrhea. So uh, those are some of the ways in which we distinguished. White cells are very important to find in the fields. Uh, the number that you find will determine whether you want to initiate the treatment or not. Uh, for men, one plus, two plus, three plus, we will treat. They, because they're asymptomatic, you'll always treat. For females, because the, the vaginal area does have white cells normally, so more than 25 per high power field, uh, in those cases, we would end up treating for chlamydia. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, uh, I would uh, uh, definitely argue that microscopes are very, very, very important for STIs. Uh, and especially if you don't have uh, a NAT testing available, use your microscope and get a great history. So those two things will, will help you rule in uh, patients with STIs. What, what comment can you make about the use of serology for the diagnosis of these STIs? And it's, common, it's more commonly here used for, for the chlamydia actually. So what comment can yeah. you make about that? Not the best. Serology is for chlamydia. Now they're saying for herpes, that's the only one they've kind of, uh, you know, uh, commented in the 2021 guidelines too. They say that, uh, you know, type specific serologies because you don't really have the typical findings on, on physical examination. So the serologies can be helpful, especially for counseling. But uh, for chlamydia, you know, even if you see respiratory infections, mycoplasma, chlamydia, we are relying a lot on uh, the rapid tests, uh, PCR testing, than serologies. Uh, serologies, you don't, uh, the, the sensitivity is not very high. It takes so long. It takes about, you know, sometimes uh, four or five days, patient's already gone, right? Um, so if you don't have a good mechanism for follow-up, uh, it's not the best um, uh, a methodology for diagnosis. Well, that seems to be it from our group. So thank you very much. I'm personally looking forward to getting to the CDC website and going through those guidelines again. And also I'm so grateful because Health for the World always makes these videos available on their YouTube channel. So we can always go through them again and relearn things. So thanks a lot, really instructive and really important in our context. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great um, actually visualizing you guys on our screen and being able to interact with you. So thank you. And thank you, Pranati, for uh, organizing this. Yeah, of course. Thank you for um, coming, giving us your time and presenting. And tech. thank you, Cameroon team and everyone who joined virtually. Um, your questions make these even better. It gives us an opportunity to discuss and share what we have and learn from you guys as well. So I always have a blast meeting all of you and um, spending my Tuesday mornings here. So thank you very much. And um, uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.